So as I was saying, you're going to know uh, as much as people in Israel know from a modern Zionist perspective. And I really do honestly think that if the people in Israel knew the kinds of things that you know here, they wouldn't have made such a mess of the recent uh, uh, Lebanon war. I mean, that showed the most incredible lack of uh, sophistication, insight, um, ideology, just everything was lacking, uh, intellectual on an intellectual level. In fact, I said to my kids, again, we need to bring family things, that if you don't know who these people are yet too much, so you'll learn, but if Herzl, Theodore Herzl, who we will study, who is considered to be the father of Zionism, uh, I'm not sure he actually is, I think it started long before him, but, but he put it in a political perspective. But he died, um, he died suddenly. Um, he died um, premature. Either he had a weak heart or in his, uh, in his, um, concern and desperation after the Dreyfus affair. You say, what's Eisenman talking about? What's the Dreyfus affair? Well, that's what you're going to learn about. Now, these are the things that the modern Jewish history reader and other things will make clear. Uh, and because uh, it'll have the whole, uh, it has all of Emil Zola's uh, Jacques in that book. And we'll read uh, Emil Zola's Jacques. And so you say, what's Jacques? I accuse. When Emile Zola, the famous French novelist, accused the whole French establishment of corruption, intellectual dishonesty, and a cover-up. And of course, a lot of you may know that Dreyfus went to Devil's Island and so on and so forth with uh, uh, Dimo, Dimo, uh, I don't know how you would call it, court-martial Dimo from the army. He was an officer in the French army, one of the only Jewish officers. and. Uh, publicly dishonored and his epaulets were torn off and thrown on the ground and buttons were pulled off his uh, uniform and so on because he was supposed to be a German spy, which he wasn't. Uh, and um, uh, Herzl was the journalist from uh, one of the uh, very well-known Austrian newspapers covering this, uh, this, uh, um, this event, not only the trial, but the event of his public, uh, I don't know what you call it, demobbing or humiliation or whatever you call it. And he was so upset by what he saw and what the, the cries that he heard from the crowd that he became obsessed with uh, founding a Jewish state. That he concluded from that that the Jews had to have a state in order to survive. But he was so obsessed with the idea, this is around 1900 or so, 19 1890s, 1900, late 1890s, early 1900s, that he uh, worked so hard that he just died suddenly about five years later of a, I guess he had a heart attack or something like that. But he saw things so clearly that I said to my uh, my uh, family members, Moss, that if, if he had lived, we wouldn't be seeing these ridiculous things we're seeing now as far as the Jewish situation, because he had such a clear view of what was necessary and what had to be. And these people today don't have any clear view at all. They're just like bumbling along and lost. So um, it's sort of like Lincoln. America went through a terrible period after the Civil War, um, which could have uh, largely been avoided if you had enlightened leadership of the kind of a Lincoln. But the most uh, dastardly, horrendous thing that really happened in this country, and I think people are aware of the tragedy, is that he was uh, shot one week after the war ended. And um, it totally uh, threw into um, uh, chaos all of what the effects of that war were. And it took 100 years <laughs> for the country to even get it on the right, you know, 
get on the right track vis-a-vis -vis what that was all about. So, I mean, uh, you can, one great man, when he's removed, can cause tremendous havoc far beyond what people imagined at the time. So, uh, Herzl was that kind of person where the Jewish people were concerned. I don't mean to wax poetic or miserable here, uh, whichever you see it, but uh, again, not to depress you or anything else. I just read in the newspaper the other day that Herzl's, uh, Herzl was brought back to Israel after the birth of the state and buried in a, one of the famous cemeteries there. And he, uh, I don't know about his wife, I don't know the whole story about what happened with his wife, but I didn't know what happened to his children. Uh, his daughter apparently was in uh, poverty or penury in Belgium on the eve of the Second World War and the so-called Zionist movement wouldn't give her any money to help her out and she died, I forget, uh, in very bad circumstances. And then his son, when he heard this, um, he converted to Christianity, but it wasn't clear that he didn't convert back again. In any case, he killed himself the next day when he heard what happened to his sister. And Herzl's other daughter died in the Holocaust. So, um, you know, there are some really tragic things that underlie these things when you, uh, the reason I read that is they're trying to bring the bodies back because in Herzl's will, he wanted his children buried near or beside him in the Holy Land. And uh, the rabbis were against it because of the suicide and the conversion. But I think they were surreptitiously trying to sneak them back in and into the graveyard or whatever. So it's a long, big story. But the point was, I'm not laughing at it. Uh, it, uh, it was on my mind, but I, I saw the, the, uh, the tragedy of that. And it's a very tragic moment for everyone. I'm not speaking about the Palestinians at the moment or the Lebanese or whatever. This is not, of course, about their history. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't deal with that. I do Islamic courses and things, but uh, the Jews get short enough shrift as far as their uh, situation goes. So we'll focus on them and their outlook, and we'll have to skip the, what the uh, morality or immorality of things may be according to the point of view of different observers. I'll leave you to worry about the morality and uh, uh, that sort of thing, but I have to stick to the Jewish issue. And I can't, um, I'm not going to get into the Palestinian issue or anything like that, except insofar as it relates to what these thinkers were thinking about at that time. And um, you can fill in the rest. In any case, we're not going to come up with a very modern period, because the last thinker that we're really doing here is uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky and Chaim Weizmann. And Jabotinsky died in 1940 before the Second World War on the eve of the Holocaust. And uh, Weizmann survived and became the first president of Israel. That wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, uh, that's not a political office, that's, a, that's just a uh, ceremonial office. And then he died not long after that. So we're not going much past the 1940s, early 1950s. Um, Lacour would, will, in the history of Zionism, he would go further, obviously, and uh, uh, you could certainly pick that book up. and. Uh, I'm not going to cover that book, which is why I'm not, not like forcing it on you if you don't want to have it. It's worth, as far as having a library, it's worth having in your library. And uh, as far as reading, there are some things in it, of course, that would be uh, useful to know and as background and so on. And um, we might refer to it. So we'll see. We'll hold that in limbo. The problem with those books, if you don't buy them right away, the bookstore sends them back at some point. So uh, that's uh, one of the issues. But as you said, with uh, Amazon.com, uh, you're, you're just a, a snap away from uh, finding these things. Okay, so um, the other reason, by the way, one last point that I've made in my other classes is having a personal library. I can't say this is the greatest book for personal library in the history of Zionism, but I still think that one of the things, and the ones that heard me say it earlier in my historical Jesus class, 
just forget it, I'll, I'm going to say it again. You know, I go to my students' houses sometimes, and I'm astonished by the barrenness of their houses. You walk into the living room, and all there is is cleanly, uh, nicely placed furniture. Uh, but, you know, everything is bare other than that. Maybe a TV set, and maybe a few uh, uh, coffee table books that used to be time live. I don't know what they are these days. But uh, there's, uh, there's no significant library. <coughs> And, um, you know, one of the things of going to a college to show that you've been to college is to have books around you. And have not, I don't mean math books. I'm not talking about computer science or chemistry uh, lab books. That's not going to affect anything. I'm talking about cultural books, literature, history, things of that kind that show that you are a civilized person. And uh, even if you're not a civilized person, people should think you are a civilized person. <laughs> you went four years to college. And therefore, you know, I always say, if I see any of my students giving books back in the, to the bookstore, I'll consider that I failed, that I sold you books that aren't worth having and keeping. And I hope that none of the books that I, you, you were in that other class I did, uh, uh, Religious Diversity, and the books we had in that class I think were worth keeping, were you saying, even though you were an assistant, uh -huh. I think. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't give you a book if I didn't think it was worth having in your personal life. And I wouldn't recommend a book that I don't think is, that would be. And, and if you don't have a personal library, even if you're in engineering or, or, or whatever the subject, you should have. Because people should walk into your house and say, oh my god, here's an educated person. <laughs> and, and they should be afraid of you. I mean, the four years at a college should, should actually mean something. You didn't waste time here, supposedly. And one of the, the accoutrements of that is that, you know, you don't have the same library that a lifeguard has or a fireman has. Not that these are dis dishonorable professions. They're, they're all worthwhile professions. But yours should be more elegant, more sophisticated. As people say, even, oh my god, that person, uh, they're well read. Yeah, yeah, that's what they should think, even if you're not. So uh, I, I do think these books are worth having, even uh, not just this class, a lot of classes. So um, I, don't, I don't talk to my colleagues that much, so I don't know what they assign, so I'm not going to speak for them. But uh, I will speak for uh, what we do in this class. So I think um, the history of Zionism, I think if we can use that book, if I find some use for it as we're moving along, I will use it. Uh, but I won't, since we're going to get these other two books, I don't want to force it on you in terms of your budget if it, it, it isn't, um, I don't know what it's selling for, but no books sell less than $15 these days. So uh, uh, I imagine it must be in that price. What's the history of Zionism selling for? It was like 18 or Yeah, that, yeah. So, you know, and it's just a paperback, you know. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a little bit uh, disconcerting. All right, uh, I just want to just hold this a minute. If you get that in mind, I'll turn this on a minute here. Uh, yeah. Speaking about relative need, I do wonder why nobody ever questions these other nations, why they exist. I mean, what, what, what are we talking about here? You mean, we're not to question Libya's existence, Algeria's existence, uh, uh, Yugoslavia shouldn't be questioned, or it is questioned, but I mean, I mean, there's hundreds of nations. Uh, they just have a right to just have a nice peaceful time of it, and no one worries about their right to where they are. You know, and it's only this one particular nation that gets questioned like this. It seems to me, uh, practically unfair. No one questions Iran's right to exist where it exists, or Turkey, or uh, Jordan, or Syria, or Lebanon. Well, well, why not? How come they're not? Uh, Egypt, that's fine. They can exist. And no one, oh, yeah, you're an Egyptian. That's fine. You can exist. You have a right to be an Egyptian. Uh, anyway, so this is something I think we'll get in the Zionist literature, not expressed the way I express it. But I often wonder, you know, I read the newspapers, I see the television broadcast on I just sort of reel and I wonder, what are you talking about? I mean, are you really, uh, are you really um, 
Are you serious? You mean all these other peoples have a right to exist? They've done, contributed to the world in some magnificent manner that they should exist and not ever be questioned? Uh, you mean to say um, uh, Bhutan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Paraguay, they should exist and no one, no, that's fine. But Israel shouldn't exist? Is that what you're trying to say? You know? Yes, I think three quarters of the world is trying to say that again, unfortunately. I really do. So I do think the Zionist uh, thought is, is important, uh, not only for uh, Jews, but even, even more for non-Jews and even for Jews, because I don't think Jews know anything about it, frankly. I talk to Jewish people, put them out of children. I, 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 I wouldn't be able to uh, get a, um, and you guys are listening to this, uh, this is the truth. I wouldn't be able to get a really serious intellectual answer from several of them all uh, on many of these issues uh, because I uh, haven't, haven't been confronted by it, haven't read it, and don't know much about it. And there's no one going to teach it to them either. Okay, so having said that, let's start at the beginning, shall we? Who are the Jews? How do they get into the predicament that, they're, that we presently see them? So, I'm going to, uh, for a while tonight, start at the beginning, okay? And uh, I'll just sketch it out quick. We know about the Bible, I don't feel too far back to there, but uh, you know, you, you know the Bible stories, uh, reliable or unreliable, people are always questioning, uh, is it or isn't it, how much of it is true, what is fiction, what is real, what is myth, and so on. But, okay. At some point, there is a coalescence of some tribal groups, and there's some struggle for what we now call Palestine. It's still going on. Uh, that's the terrible thing. Uh, if uh, Mel Gibson has anything to say about it, it's probably going to go on forever. I hope that he doesn't get control of the UN, although it seems to be more people of his mindset there than, uh, than others, so I'm uh, kind of frightening. But in any case, where does the word Palestine come from? How many know? I don't know. Uh, I think I'll just keep talking. I'll probably take a break tonight and just see how far we get, okay? Because uh, usually I would take a break at 8 or 15, but that would be stupid. I'm just going to go a bit. Okay, and then as soon as we get tired, we'll go home. Okay? All right. Palestine. Philistines. There you go. How do you know so much? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to be from Persia. I mean, how would you know that this is Philistine? Or do you speak the native language, you know it's Philistine? From, from the Bible, it talks about oh, the Bible, it's yeah. Really well, even the Arabs today in Persia, not Arabs. But, in fact, they don't really get along that well from what I used to. I've been through Iran three times, and back in the days of the Shah, I hitchhiked through Iran, and uh, I've been all the way across from Tehran to Tabriz. Someone you say I was a, what, you, what kind of music group was that you mentioned? Uh, was I one of yeah, yeah. No, I was really a, an on-the-road person. And uh, I went through Iran when it was uh, under the Shah, before the Ayatollahs and so on. And, Tabriz, Tehran, Isfahan, Zahidan, all the way to Pakistan, when things were peaceful, when you could go to these places back in the back in the 60s, early 60s. On, on the you journey over to my country? I was on the road, man. I was on the road. Just vacation? Yeah, no, I wasn't on vacation. I always thought when I was a CIA agent. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I was. I'll tell you something. Again, uh, all right, but the point is that if you know Arabic, it is true that the, Philist uh, the word Philistine is the Arabic word for Palestine. The Philistine, that's what the uh, Palestinians call them. And it comes from the word Philistine. He's absolutely right. From the Bible. But how did it get applied to this part of the world in the Palestine framework, in the Palestina, as it was called at one point? Uh, anyone know how 
dog out blind here? Well, the Romans, when they wiped out Jewish existence there, felt that, uh, see, at that time, time of Jesus and others, oh, hey, thanks. At the time of Jesus and others, um, don't forget me, I'll give it back to you, okay? Oh, I will. Um, at the time of Jesus and others, it was still Judea, as you know. And uh, why wasn't it Israel? I'll explain that to you in a moment term. Uh, but the Philistines were on the coast. And, and, and we know, um, in fact, they're where modern Israel is now. They're more like where Tel Aviv was. And the Jews were in the hills, were in the hill country where the Palestinians are today. The whole thing is reversed. Now, by the way, if you did DNA of a lot of those people, not all of them, but you know, maybe 25% um, of them, I'm sure you'd find that they had ancient Judean DNA of, of the uh, so-called Palestinian people that we have, because a lot of those villages never left. And um, they just get culturally swept over into different categories of uh, culture, and religion and so on. So if you did uh, if you did DNA, I'm sure you'd find that to be the case. Um, in any case, the Philistines, as we know somewhat, came from Greece. How do we know that? Because they're, so, you know, they're, they're not even modern Palestinians. They came from Greece. Uh, because they're part of that whole uh, Mycenaean cultural expansion that was going on, time of the Trojan Wars. <coughs> in fact, they're probably some of the some of the tribes of the Trojan War period. Trojan War, of course, encapsulates all that into into a myth, if you want to call it that. But they're probably some of those tribes, the Danites or something they were called. I can't remember some of the different names. Even the Jews say the Philistines who came from Kaftor, and Kaftor is Crete. Uh, the Egyptians know them because there are um, wall uh, reliefs, paintings of Ramesses and some of the other pharaohs fighting off the so-called what they call the peoples of the sea. The Sea Peoples, and these were Greek uh, sort of uh, marauders, bandits, people like the boat people that landed in Troy and fought that war. That's about 11, 1200 BC period, around the time Moses is supposed to have been leaving Egypt. Maybe he left earlier or something. Am I losing you here? Well, I, I, what I'm trying to get it a little bit focused. These people were sent up the coast and settled on the coast of Palestine. Now there were indigenous people there who were what we call Canaanites. But that's really a Phoenician culture. You know, what we know as, of the, as the Phoenicians. But they really were what we would call biblically Canaanites. So the Greek peoples came and got onto the coastal areas, particularly what we now call Gaza, uh, Ashkelon, some of the areas south of Tel Aviv towards Egypt. That's where they settled in. So the Bible covers the wars, and I think that's historical material there, between David and the Philistines. So by the time we get to David, I'm not treating Moses and Abraham, because that's already in the realm of literature. And I, you know, it's a, it's a toss-up how historical all of that is. People even question the conquest, but I think there was a conquest under a Joshua-like person. I, I, I think there probably was. Now, they go archaeologically, they question whether all the signs of a conquest are there or not. I mean, you know, I can't get into all that. Uh, which year it happened, which cities were taken, which cities weren't taken. But whether it was a peaceful, whether everyone left at the Exodus period, uh, whether there were local peoples who were absorbed, who knows. But there was really a conquest of some kind, of some of the areas, and an amalgamation. And there would have been, and there was a David. And he was a pretty victorious sort of king. And he did fight the Philistines. 
and he did sort of bring the kingdom to its highest uh, political economic point. Now, what year would that be? 1000 BC. Pretty, pretty even. 1000 BC. 1050. And the temple would have been started under him, finished under Solomon. Solomon goes from about 950 BC. So we're in the realm of history, more or less. Then. Okay? But this is mainly in the hill country. The sea, the Philistines uh, are in control. And that's where the word Palestina comes from. When the Romans finally succeeded in wiping the Jews out for all intents and purposes in two wars, what were the two wars that were fought against Rome? When were they fought? 70 AD. And the second one? They didn't just put up down their weapons in 70 AD. It started up again, called the Bar Kokhba Uprising in 132 to 136, and that was more severe. And the results of the Bar Kokhba Uprising were much more uh, pervasive. Why don't we know as much about the Bar Kokhba Uprising as the, as the uh, 70 AD one? Because we don't have a Josephus. Uh, Josephus was the historian of the period, if you have heard of him, now you have anyway, you can that, who was the eyewitness reporter of this time. And so he left us an encyclopedic, not always reliable, but encyclopedic account of that period. And we don't have that for the Bar Kokhba period. So the, the period that the Jewish war that he wrote covers is 66 to really 73, because Masada, famous event, we wouldn't know anything about it except for Josephus. All the defendants committed suicide rather than surrender to Rome, that was 73. That was also, I think, around the time of the year of the triumph in Rome. Uh, how do we know about the triumph in Rome? Josephus. What artifact in Rome commemorates that triumph? How have you been to Rome? Forum, Arch of Titus. Titus was the son of the victorious Roman general who took over the emperorship at this time. So you had the people in the start with Jesus Christ. Actually, I think that this one has more ink in it still. It just squeaks a bit more. Let me just see how this works. Um, Vespasian and uh, his son Titus. And this is a new imperial group called the Flavians. Which is, that's a new family. The old family was Julius Caesar up to Nero. How many have been watching that uh, series in Television Rome, HBO. It's really good, isn't it? Extremely good. I mean, it's a bit melodramatic and so on for a modern taste, but I recommend it highly. It's, it's pretty accurate. Uh, and it's extremely well done uh, by people who know their history. And uh, it's just really good. I think they're going to replay it, and they're going to have a second season next spring. They've gotten up to Julius Caesar's assassination in this particular series. And then they're obviously going to have the wars of Augustus and Octavius. But uh, it's really good. For television, modern television, well, it's the best thing you see historically for recent memory, even though it's a bit you know, sexed up and stuff like that. But you have to do that for modern taste. Okay. So, um, the first war was ended in 73 with the Masada, but there was another one under this person called Bar Kokhba. second uh, leader, and he clearly had uh, messianic pretensions. Kochba in Hebrew was, that's not his name, Bar Sonom. 
But you know what Kokhba means in Hebrew? Wisdom. Huh? Wisdom? No, that's Kokhba. This is Kokhba. So, uh, Kokhba is star. Son of the star. It's from the star prophecy. Star will rise out of Jacob, a scepter to rule the world, Numbers 24, 17. And uh, Jesus in the New Testament, the star over Bethlehem is really relates to the star promise. That's why they portray a star. I also think that's where you get the Hebrew star from, symbolizing the Jewish people, that this star is supposed to have some significance for the Jews. It has to do with the Messianic prophecy. Anyway, he wasn't called Bar Kokhba. In fact, he took the name, and the rabbis ridiculed him for uh, taking it. And they said, grass will grow in your grave. Uh, one of these rabbis who supported it before the Messiah comes, they say to him. In other words, uh, they're ridiculing the fact that Bar Kokhba had messianic pretensions. And uh, we have actually found letters that he signed. We found that since Israel was reborn, you know, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, this government is dumb enough that they're going to go thinking of giving back the area where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Probably the most uh, culturally significant. Uh, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, these people don't have these people don't have a clue. They're like living in cuckoo land, and they have no cultural, uh, uh, intellectual awareness of what they're doing and what they're about. And uh, if they did, I mean, there's no one out by where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. They don't need to give that back to anybody. And they're just insanity. Uh, but never mind. Uh, I'm not the government of Israel. If I were, you'd have a different situation, I can tell you that. But um, um, that's why I'm in California. I left there, I left there 30 or 40 years ago because they'd already given up on what kind of leadership one had there. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, go hide in California and, uh, and uh, write my books, which I've done. Now, I have another book coming out, you know, in October, I told you. Uh, it's called The New Testament Code. Uh, the Cup of the Lord, Damascus Covenant, and the Blood of Christ. And it's a thousand pages. And uh, it's going to get out before my footnotes are out, but that's why I'm going to put the footnotes online. So. Uh, otherwise, we would never get the book out. So. Don't tell me that, but that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Too many footnotes. A reader wouldn't want to read all those footnotes anymore. So. But anyway, getting back to, um, it'll be out in Barnes and Noble. I, 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 I understand. So, uh, you can even Google it up, and they're selling it. They're selling two versions of it. They're selling it for a year and a half, but they don't even realize that it's not two books and only one. In any case. Um, I left long ago for those reasons that I just told you and came out and hid in California. And I'm happy California is a nice place, but uh, the thing I just told you about earlier does worry me about California at the present time. In any case, uh, to go back to Bar Kokhba, um, the outcome of that uprising was terrible, and they were eradicated and forbidden to enter Jerusalem. Again, ever, except once a year, on the 9th of Ab, the day Jerusalem fell in the first uprising, and to wail, or so-called, or cry at the Wailing Wall, or whatever you want to call it, the Western Wall, depending on what. That's where that whole tradition of the wailing at the Western Wall comes from. The Romans, uh, after the defeat in the second uprising, not the first, forbade them to go into Jerusalem ever again. Uh, except on that one day to be well of their fate. It was a very cruel sort of a punishment, if you want to call it that, uh, to show Roman. The Romans were very cruel, and uh, anyone who idealizes Rome, you know, really uh, ought to go out and, uh, you know, the way they uh, treated subject people was really terrifying as far as. Uh, wiping out all their people where they treated Gaul and other places, Britain and so on. I mean, the places that they stamped or stamped on have never been the same since. They've left their mark absolutely. And it still goes to the modern world. So uh, the Romans were 
very cruel in many ways. That's why I don't like Mel Gibson's movie. Uh, because uh, you know, it's just not an accurate picture. Uh, but anyway, for, let's forget that. Um, the fate of the Jews was more or less sealed, and that's why it's so important to understand that wailing wall. And that, uh, we've heard about the wailing wall. It's because they were supposed to go there and cry. Once a year. Bemoan their fate. Uh, there are even these uh, coins that the Romans issued that show a Jewish capital. I have them in my book called Judea Capta Coins. And it'll show a Jewish woman crying under a palm tree. That's where the weeping comes from. Palm tree was symbolizing Israel. And on the other side, it was a picture of Vespasian, the conquering general, soon to be emperor of, 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 of Rome. I have it in my before I come to the book. You'll see a picture of it, that book. But, you know, they were called Judaic Captive Coins, and they were issued in the name of Vespasian and his son Titus. <coughs> the Arch of uh, Titus, which is the arch that everyone copies, Constantine, Napoleon, everyone else, it's got scenes of uh, the Jewish captives coming to Rome, carrying, if you don't know, the candelabra. How many have seen the pictures from that arch where they're carrying the... This is the, uh, the captives that are then going to be uh, slaughtered in the, uh, in the uh, arena and so uh, It's not just Christians. In fact, I don't think Christians were yet being dealt with in that way. And <coughs> Jewish captives were being treated that way. And later, Christian martyrs, but not, not, not in the first century, I don't think. It was mostly these prisoners that they were taking in these wars. And then feeding them to the uh, gladiator and other things that were, they were doing. They would also execute uh, lots of people at the Triumph just for fun. Like when they had the, the Gallic War and they took Vercingetorix, then Caesar would have him in chains and then they would, uh, I forget how they did it to him, but they kept him in chains for a year or two and then when the Triumph was held in, disembodied him or something, you know, just a horrific type of thing to show them. Triumph of Rome. That's what they did to captives. You didn't surrender quick enough. They wiped out old cities and things like that. Which is why, I mean, I'm not too excited about the New Testament portrait of the Sea of Galilee because I know, I read my Josephus, and I know that the Romans slaughtered everyone around the Sea of Galilee because they resisted. And uh, the, the, the sea ran red with the blood, Josephus says, of the people. And then they took captives, everybody, around the Sea of Galilee from all those towns. That's why the New Testament writers know those towns. They took the captives, and they used them to build the Corinth Canal, and they gave uh, some to the Roman general, some to the Herodian king. And the old, uh, the old people and the, the infants, they killed. They slaughtered them all. And the uh, rest were put in slavery. Uh, but, you know. To make the Holly, didn't make the Hollywood movies. So uh, uh, the, the, the retribution things were huge. Anyway, I'm way ahead of myself. Just want to work up to that point. Why is that important? Because that's going to set the tone for the treatment of Jews in Europe for the next 1,500,000, almost 2,000 years. And that's why it's important to know that, you follow me? I mean, I don't think you just pick the Jewish fate up right out of, you know, oh, look at the Jews in 1700. Well, that, well how did they get to that position in 1700? We have to, to have some inkling on how that happened. So let's go back again. So David is around 1000 BC, 1050, Solomon 950, the first temple is built in that period in Jerusalem. So, you know, all right, we had, an, um, most of you know the Abraham stories, the Moses Exodus story, you know, you've seen Cecil B. DeMille and everybody, yeah, you know, all those stories, whether accurate or not, I can't say. And Joshua, most people have heard about the conquest and so on. So I don't have to cover that, and I'm not sure how historical it all is. You know, it's literary after all. But from David on, it's pretty historical. And um, we've even found some archaeological evidence with David's name on it. So I think it's, uh, we can pretty much rely on that. After Solomon, the, um, they weren't strong enough to hold the kingdom together. There was always the northern tribes and southern tribes. The northern tribes broke away and started their own state in the north. 
because they didn't like the Davidic kingship. Well, what tribe did David come from? Because of Jesus is supposed to be the same tribe. What, what Judah. 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 So that's where the word Jew comes from. Judea. Judah. But that wasn't the whole group. That was only one tribe. The rest were the northern tribes, the ten lost tribes of Israel, as they're called. The Israel, state of Israel. But when the uh, break came, in the 900 period, the northern area was more um, flourished more than the southern area. It was more economically um, prosperous than the southern area. And um, things were looking very good for them for the next couple of hundred years. It was the south that sort of fell back into backwardness more. Although well, most of the prophets that you know in the front, if you're a Christian uh, reader of the Bible, most of the prophets are southern prophets. Amos, uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, all those people are southern prophets. Don't forget the southerners ultimately collected the Bible as we know it. They didn't collect the northern texts so much. Uh, so we don't know a lot, and we don't know. Well, what happened was the Assyrian conquest came along. The Assyrians were a very powerful northern Assyrian group, uh, had a very flourishing empire around where, you know, well, up in the northern part of Iraq and northern part of Syria today. And uh, if you go to the British Museum, you'll see all their sculptures there. They're absolutely a huge collection of Assyrian sculptures in the British Museum that they brought from places like Nineveh and places like that. You can see the uh, pictures. Anyway, they came in and they were successful in the north and wiped the north out and basically exiled the north. Their uh, way of treating conquered peoples was to basically cut off the head. I don't think you see these pictures of them going to captivity. That's not how it works. The notables, the influential people, the, the people worth something were sent to captivity in some areas. But the, the peasants, the uh, sort of, you know, salt of the earth, they, they, they didn't don't march all those people up. They just kind of stayed there. But since there was no really functioning government to protect them or, they, or, or things like that, they would have been subject to marauders and different other incursions. Things wouldn't have been very uh, well organized or together, and things would have been falling apart after you cut the the top slice off. Now, and the Syrians may have gone further. They may have taken more people away. Uh, but they resettled people somewhere in Iran or further around out that way. And in fact, if you go to Afghanistan today, and I've been to Afghanistan back in those days, on the train, people would come up to me and say, oh, you came from Israel? I'm an I'm a Israelite. I'm, and people in Afghanistan would say this. Uh, because they have all the, uh, a lot of the names, the tribal names in Afghanistan are Israelite type tribal names. And um, people say, the 10 lost tribes, where did they go? Well, they probably melted away in places like <laughs> Afghanistan, which were part of the eastern part of the Persian uh, Assyrian Empire at that time. Uh, so there are groups in Afghanistan still make those things, whether real or imagined, again, DNA would probably we have some interest in that regard. I'm sure DNA is going to be very helpful in the future in historical studies of those kinds of things. So whatever happened, the conquest of the Assyrians didn't get down to the south. The south was miraculously saved because there was trouble back home and they left off the campaign and they went back. They besieged Jerusalem for a while, but the king of Jerusalem, a fellow called Hezekiah, had built a water tunnel and uh, you could go down underground and get, and get to the water channels without having the conquerors know where they were or um, impede you. So Jerusalem was miraculously saved, though a lot of the other parts of the country were uh, decimated. But the Judeans in the south then took this as something miraculous, and the prophets particularly sprung up at that time. You have a lot of prophets coming at that time, you know, saying the north fell because of its sins and so on and so forth, and the south survived, even though it's got a lot of sins, but, you know, it survived, and, and you know, and then, how many have read Amos? He's a prophet uh, operating at that time. He said, Yahweh, or the Lord, or, or Jehovah, roars from Zion. 
Zion was the seat of the Davidic family in Jerusalem. It was a, it was a small hill area in Jerusalem called Mount Zion. So when the prophets speak about Jerusalem, David, and things like that, they speak about Zion. Of course, the Mormons now speak about Zion being out in Utah, which is fine, and we have Zion National Park, and different things like that, and there's the, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, so there's a huge Jewish plot somewhere to take over the world, supposedly, that's been proven to be a czarist forgery that they circulated and undermined socialism, which they thought had been created by Jews, and was uh, basically run by Jews, they thought, so they could then blame the Jews for their attack on socialism and uh, things of that kind and make it look as if there was a, a little, you know, a little constituency of Jews. If you know Jews, you know they don't sit and plot very much because they never agree with each other. And as everyone said, you well, have a room of 10 Jews, you probably have 11 opinions or something. That's maybe too complimentary to the Jewish people, but in fact that's what people say. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that, I've never met any of them capable of plotting anything, frankly. If they were so capable of plotting everything, they wouldn't be in the terrible situation they're in today. So uh, I don't really uh, I don't really see this plot thing uh, as even semi-serious or even <coughs> minusculely serious. But a lot of people who have um, access to grind and inferior, inferiority complexes themselves or are worked up about something or uh, have a problem love to focus in on that particular thing. It kind of makes them feel better for some reason. If someone lower than themselves to kick, that's great for them. So uh, it's uh, always the uh, the refuge of, uh, I think, um, a lot of losers. Unfortunately, after World War One, all the losers got control of a country through democracy. Democracy doesn't always bring about what Bush is trying to bring about. It can bring about insane people taking over when the situation is desperate, which is often what happens. You have to have institutions to make democracy run. You have to have institutions that people recognize, care about, uh, uh, honor, and so on, sort of like the American Constitution brought into, it, into being. You just can't throw democracy into a country like Iraq. Uh, you see what the chaos is now. Uh, and you know who's going to come out and control. All the bully boys are going to come out and in uh, control, the people who can cut more throats, kill more people, behead more uh, people, and you know, and uh, um, when you intimidate and intimidate more people, and that's what happened in Germany after World War One. So what I'm trying to say, all the losers, lost souls, bullies, and others came out of the woodwork, took over. You got the Holocaust. Um, you know. Because all those city, all the societies collapsed, and so all their uh, maniacal uh, predispositions came to the fore. But it became part of the government, not just down in an underclass. Or, uh, Hitler is someone I've never seen as someone. So look at Gerber. Look at these people. These are, these are subhuman that, who are calling other people subhuman, which is what the problem is. When you are almost subhuman yourself, it's great to be able to call someone else that. But in any case, I, I, what I'm trying to say is uh, th th these things are beyond where we're at. Let's just go back quickly and I'll let you go. Uh, I'll just keep you a little while longer. I'll try to get up to a certain point, and, um, up to the period of the emancipation, and then we'll go. Let, let, let me just um, go back then. So the South thought that it had sur survived a miracle, and this were all the prophets that you're familiar with, where Zion comes from. You know, Zion is not a plot. Zion is a, a beautiful nationalist um, sort of um, proclamation. What Zionism is, is Jewish nationalism. It's simple, no more, no less than that. And it's honored every, the problem is we gave it a name. And by giving it a name, then people can hate it. If you, don't, if you, don't, if you can't put your, uh, your finger on something and categorize it, you, can't, you, you, you then can't generate the hatred that you might feel otherwise. So when you uh, can pigeonhole something and say, oh, the Zionists, you know, you hear how that word is thrown around now. So maybe it was sad that they used that term to express what others call Palestinian nationalism or 
uh, uh, Bolivian nationalism or Argentinian nationalism or French nationalism. Everyone thinks nationalism is fun. But unfortunately, the Jews had a prophetical name for it, Zion. And that became attached to it. And that then took the beating that we now see it taking among some people. Others who are religious see it as something magnificent and uh, beautiful. But I'm afraid those people are in some of a minority worldwide because uh, not too many people study scripture anymore. So there's one argument. Anyway, so the South then stumbled on for another 150 years, and then the Babylonians came, and then they took the South. That would be around 585. And they destroyed the first temple, the Davidic temple. That was where the prophets all were focusing their attention on. That's how we we're so interested in the temple, because of the prophets. By the way, the reason the Muslims were interested in the Temple Mount is because of the Jewish prophets. It's nothing to do with Muhammad or the Quran as such. He's interested because he knows the biblical literature. So it all comes from these prophets. Christianity comes from these prophets. I think Islam comes from these prophets. Uh, the writings of these prophets. It's very dangerous to put writings on paper because you don't ever know where it's going to germinate. And maybe there's good and maybe there's bad. You'll have to be the judge of that yourself. So, Nick, I want to try to get you up to the fall of the temple and then uh, we'll let you go. So, um, things were really uh, in bad shape. The uh, Babylonians, again, took away the, the top class and brought them to Babylon. And sort of, even the Davidic kings had descendants in Babylon. Um, I forget the name of the Davidic king that was uh, that was there. Um, um, what was his name? The last one, I think. Zerubbabel. Um, um, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Something that we think is a weird name. He's the Davidic descendant in Babylon. Zerubbabel. The point is, Babel, you know, that's where we get the Babel of languages from in the Bible, because Babel is really Babel, Babel. It's the Hebrew word. So this is Zeru Shuta, or Shuta of David in Babylon. It's not just some gobbledygook word that you get in the Bible. <laughs> it actually has meaning, you see. And um, if you tell me what it means, it, sort of, it just changes their mindset, right? Oh, what? Zerubbabel isn't just a lot of nonsense? No, no, it means Babel is Babylon and Zero is a uh, shoot plant, you know, uh, something growing up. So it's a beautiful name. Anyway, he's the last Davidic descendant. Uh, he goes back, I think, at some point, but we don't know what happens to him. Our books don't cover it. And that's where we get this lost Davidic family. Uh, Jesus, Zero Babel, or uh, is in Jesus' genealogy as far as the New Testament is concerned. It claims it can go down after him, but. Um, whether they can or not is something you'll have to decide, but the point is that he's the last one that we can document to any extent. What people claim five or six centuries later is, uh, look, I can claim descent from Dante, but I'm not sure you're gonna credit. I mean, claiming descent from David in Jesus' time is sort of like claiming descent from Dante in ours. It's, you know, it's, uh, maybe, maybe you'll credit me and maybe you won't. Uh, it's not even like claiming descent from George Washington, which you probably wouldn't even believe. So, uh, but it's uh, about 700 years more than that. Anyway, so um, the northern uh, kingdom does break away into a kind of Samaritan group, because Samaria was the name, final name of the northern capital. And that's why the Jews talk about it as Shomron, because in Hebrew, Samaria is Shomron. And you have in the New Testament the Good Samaritan. That's the northern kingdom, the name of the capital. So the southern kingdom, the Judeans who stayed there, had a dim view of the northerners who stayed. And they thought they were a kind of bastard race mixed with all different other peoples who had come in and settled there. Greek, Roman legionnaires, people like that. And uh, whether they're correct or not, I don't know. But the Samaritans have their Pentateuch, their five books of Moses, and they still exist. There's about, I don't know, I think there's around a couple of thousand Samaritans that still exist today. And most of them live near Tel Aviv because they don't get on with the Arabs so well. They've left the, where they used to live, which was Shechem. How many have heard of Shechem? Shechem is what we now call Nablus. 
the Tem was the, one of the northern uh, areas, and I'll write a quick map here. I'm taking longer than I want. You want to go home? You're fed up. I have. Uh, I think. Let me just find you. Okay. Here is Jerusalem. This is Palestine. This is the spine of uh, mountains. This is Philistine too. Okay. This is uh, Shechem. And this is Samaria. Now, this is now Nablus. And the Jews call this Shomron. But Samaria in Hebrew is Shomron. That was their name. Uh, Nablus. Why is Nablus Shechem? Comes from the Greek, Neapolis. Arabic doesn't have a P in it. Therefore, Pope in Arabic is. Not Papa, but Baba, Abdi Baba, and uh, uh, Neapolis is Neapolis, 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 Neapolis. Constantinople comes down to Constantinople, Stanople, Stonon, Stambul, Stambul, Stanbul, Istanbul. The P goes into a B. There's no B in Arabic. Uh, Paris in Arabic is Paris. There is no B. So whenever you see a, uh, there's a P, there's a B. So wherever you see a B in Arabic, you know there probably often was a P. Uh, and that was like, and so Nablus is pretty, it's a new city built on the old city of Shechem by the later inhabitants, by the Romans, Greeks, and others. That's why the, anyway, make a long story short, the Bible documents the return of the Jews from captivity in the 400s, 500s, 400s. The attempts to rebuild the temple, and somehow in the 400s, the temple gets rebuilt. I want to get into all that. That's the second temple. They limp down through to the Maccabean period, which is about the 170s. They're fighting two groups of people, the descendants of Alexander the, the um, Great. One is in Syria. So over here are the Syrians, or what we would call the Seleucids. I don't want to bore you for the name. Over here are the Egyptians, which are both Greek kingdoms now, under the control of Alexander's generals. He divided it up into four generals before he died, or they divided it afterwards. That's where you get the book of Daniel, the four winds, the four kingdoms. The four kingdoms are the kingdoms of Alexander's generals after he dies. I can give you the whole book of Daniel in another class. I don't have time in this class, but you know Daniel. I can show you all of what Daniel's talking about. Because he's talking about uh, the he-goat that comes and roars through. That's Alexander the, the Great. He even tells you at one point and all the division into the four winds of the four kingdoms, that's the descendants and so on. Anyway, Palestine is under the control for a while of the Ptolemies in Egypt. This would be the 300s and 200s. The Ptolemies, you know, who's the last Ptolemaic ruler? Cleopatra, a time of Julius Caesar. And he takes over that area and becomes a Roman prophet. And then she has a bad end, and uh, his child has a bad end. This, at some point, the, these Greek people take over, and that produces the Maccabean uprising, because they're less tolerant than these people. So in around 170 or so BC, you get an uprising against Seleucid Syrian control. That's a Greco-Syrian control. And that's the second independent Jewish kingdom led by the Maccabean family. And the Jews commemorate that to this day. What's their commemoration called? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. What does Hanukkah mean? I hope this is useful for you. I think it fills in some pieces maybe. I'll get up to the present, don't worry. What does Hanukkah mean? Now, that's what the rabbis try to make it out to be. It's nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah, it has to do with not the, it's the, it's the Greeks that they forced to win. <laughs> the Romans hadn't come yet. Uh, we're in the 200 BC, 150 BC period. The Romans are uh, stretching out of the Eastern Mediterranean in this period. But they're, they're, they're allies of the Jews in this period, actually. Jews, uh, it's in the Maccabee books if you read it. It's in the book of Daniel if you read it, you'll see that the Romans uh, defeat uh, a Greco-Phoenician fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
in this period. It's mentioned in the book of Daniel. In any event, Daniel's writing it around this period of time of the Maccabean uprising, even though it looks like it's, he's trying to make it look like it's a prophecy book, that it's a 5th, 6th century BC, but it's not, it's a 2nd century BC. In any case, that's another class. But a lot of people love Daniel, and therefore I mention him. How many of you have read Daniel in this class? Yeah, a lot of people love Daniel. And, uh, he's really interesting literature. The rabbis don't put him under prophets because they don't consider him a prophet. They consider that literature. They're frightened of Daniel. Because Daniel is a new form of uh, writing. It's what we would call apocalyptic. And uh, rabbis don't like it. And therefore they took him out of the prophets. So if you pick up a Christian Bible, you'll find Daniel in the, uh, in the prophets. If you pick up a Jewish Bible, you'll find him in the writings. Uh, so uh, they just don't like Daniel. They got, they got it against him for some reason. Because he, he, the spirit of Daniel provoked some of these uprisings and also the messianic movement that ended up in Christianity. So there's a lot going on there. In any case, Daniel is uh, functioning around the time of this Maccabean uprising. You may have heard of that, but if you haven't, it's led by Judas Maccabee. And that's why the Jews take the temple and it had been you know, paganized, it had been in ruins, uh, the Seleucids had decimated it, it put a statue of the Olympian Zeus up in there purified the temple, and that's where Hanukkah gets its name from, the rededication. The Jews call it festival of lights because they light uh, candles and stuff, but it's nothing to do with lights. It has to do with, re Hanukkah is the rededication of the temple by Judas Maccabee. That's what it is. It's a totally nationalistic festival. Completely. And Jewish independence, therefore, flourishes. Josephus covers this, you can read it. But this will go down until the coming of the Romans the next century. Now that Rome thing that I told you about covers a lot of this, but it covers a lot of the struggle uh, between Pompey and Caesar. Two Roman generals who are vying for control in the 70s and 60s. And Caesar wins the civil war. Pompey is killed in Egypt, but that Rome thing has the killing of Pompey, I think, in it. In any case, um, Pompey is a Roman general in the east. Mark Anthony is in his group. And he comes down through there. Oh, the Romans want booty. That's what they're after. Well, conquest is money to them. They just clean these areas out. When they, just like Britain used to do a place like India and a place like that. They just clean these places out when they conquer. And that's why they're, you know, they finance their pol politics back in Rome. Caesar financed his politics from all of the booty he took in Gaul. Then he could give it to the Roman crowd and sort of, you know, be a crowd pleaser. Vespasian uh, built the Colosseum from the Jewish temple temple treasure. So for the uh, uh, entertainment of the Roman mob, blood sports for the entertainment of the Roman mob, but the money came from the sacking of Jerusalem, not for Roman taxes. Anyway, um, that's another day, another story. But the point being, those are all interesting points, but the Maccabees survive, and then the Romans are coming down in the 70s from Syria, and Josephus covers all that in his books, which is why he's so interesting. But So we have a pretty detailed account of it all, but two of the Maccabees are, brothers are quarreling with each other, and one will not pay obeisance to the Romans, the other goes over to the Romans, and then he brings in a Roman army, and Herod's father is an Arab Philistine background. Herod's not a Jew. Herod is a Greco-Arab. His father was a priest. His grandfather was a priest of Apollo in Gaza. And uh, he's a, a convert. I don't think he's a convert to Judaism. But the point is his father is an intermediary in the Roman troops and some of the situations, he made himself useful. He was a go-between of some kind. Anyway, the Romans stormed the temple in 63 BC. So the temple is stormed a third time. We have, well, I guess it's the second time. The Babylonians are now in 63 BC. It'll be a third time in 70 AD. And uh, they slaughter all the priests who resisted them. Josephus gives a really good account. And uh, they support part of the Maccabean family, but not very much. The other brother they execute and so on. 
and they take over and put in Roman governors, and the first Roman governor is Herod's father. And that's how Herod is able to create a kingdom for himself on the backs of the Maccabees. And people don't understand this history at all, so we get Herod king of the Jews. This is just rubbish. This is never a king of the Jews. He was hated by the whole Jewish people. He was a Roman bureaucrat that was put over them and made a family dynasty by executing all the Maccabeans who were beloved. But, you know, does this come through the New Testament? Of course not. No. So you hear, oh, Herod wanted to kill all the Jewish children and wanted to kill Jesus. Yeah, I'm sure he did want to kill people who were going to supplant him. But this is blamed on the Jews, you see, as if Herod is a representative of the Jewish people. This is all, you know, that's why one has to really, I'm not trying to be apologetic here, I'm trying to, you know, trying to give some sorted out properly. So this has all been obfuscated by this literature. People who were writing it didn't even know very, very well. So it's really frightening what has happened, because the Jews now are blamed for Herod, <laughs> when he's actually a Roman puppet, a Roman puppet king, who they hate, and who revolutionary leader after revolutionary leader struggled to overthrow and was in turn flailed, burned, uh, you know, every kind of horrendous death that Josephus uh, gives them all to you. It's a frightening history. And anyway, this goes on all the way up till 66. And um, when, the, when the rebellion finally, well, there's a rebellion going on for literally from the time, well, the Romans take over, the rebellion goes out, the Maccabeans try to come back, they get some Persian help at this time, and then the Roman armies come back in, restore Herod. This time his father's dead, and they put him in as king. Herod jumps from Caesar to uh, Mark Antony to uh, Octavius to Augustus. He's a very good politician. He, he, he comes back with two Roman legions, storms the temple again in 37 BC against the Jewish nationalist patriot revolutionaries with Roman help and takes the temple. That's the third time. And then of course he kills everyone that resists him. When he dies there's more uprisings, 4 BC, and uh, um, huge dis, dis, uh, uh, unrest. And the Romans finally put a governor in in 7 AD. That's the census that they take that Jesus' birth is, 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 uh, is dated by. That's in Josephus, 6 to 7 AD. They make a census because they've taken over the country totally. Before that, the Rhodians were the Roman tax collectors in Palestine, which is why Jesus is portrayed in the New Testament as sitting with tax collectors and sinners, because he's portrayed as accepting such people. I don't think he did. Certainly no Jewish Messianic leader ever did. That's one of the issues you have from an overseas presentation of Jewish Messianism with a native presentation of Jewish Messianism. And the native presentation of Jewish Messianism is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are sort of like something that we discovered in 48 in the caves along the Dead Sea, which are like a time capsule into the past. But these are actual records that were put in the caves at the time of the war against Rome in 70 AD. And so um, they give you a, a, a history of the period. It's hard to decipher, obviously, but it can give you a picture of the period, which has not gone through <coughs> the editorial processes of the Roman Empire. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the <laughs> Gospels as we have them have gone through the editorial processes of the Roman Empire, which is why Roman governors are portrayed fairly, uh, not neutrally, even positive. Herod uh, and Herodian kings. Herod doesn't want to kill John the Baptist. A woman does a sexy dance <laughs> and gets him to do it. Well, yeah, only Josephus has the real story. Herod killed John the Baptist because he was afraid, he was so popular among the people, that the people would do anything he might suggest, and he, he thought that he would suggest a revolt. And therefore, lest he be uh, sorry afterward at his, uh, at his um, kindness, he had John executed. And nothing about a woman dancing or anything like that. So, you know, this is the history you have to weigh. It's tough stuff. I'm going to do it in my historical Jesus class with you guys. It's, uh, it, it's very few people deal with it. Jews don't know it. Christians don't know it. Muslims certainly don't know it. <laughs> so.
So we're in a huge well of ignorance. But for a start, even though Josephus is a, is a, is a, I don't want to call him a scumbag, he still gives you the history of the period from his own perspective. And he has an encyclopedic control because he was a Roman interrogator of prisoners. He'd gone over to the Roman side and he knew everything. He was an intelligence officer. And he lays it all out and he's got a huge, I mean, we know more about this period from his writings than we know about any period since until maybe about, you know, 16, 1700s when we get into serious printing and printing presses and written history. But, I mean, we have a vast amount of information from, uh, from his uh, writing of this one current, interestingly enough. Okay, uh, in any event, I'm uh, losing the focus, but the point is Herod is, is there, the people are against him, they're against his descendants, he's executed all the Maccabeans, the few he hasn't, the last Maccabean priestly claimant, the people wept when he put on the, pre, on, the pre, high, on the high priestly robes because the Maccabeans were priest kings. He was, uh, I think, um, 13 years old or something like that. And Herod then took him down to his pool in Jericho and had him drowned, uh, you know, because he knew what the, people, what the people wanted. When Herod died, according to Josephus, he ordered that his followers to take all the principal men, put them in a stadium and execute them so that they would be crying at his bar, at his, at his, at his death. Uh, the, that's where you get Herod wanted to kill all of the Jewish children, I think, from. Uh, the, the point was is that the, the successors realized they couldn't do that or they would be in serious trouble, so they didn't do that. But that was what the, that was what the orders that he left. Uh, some of like, uh, the closest thing to Herod would be Saddam Hussein. That's about, that's about where we're at. With, with <laughs> Okay, so the, so the Jews do struggle against Roman rule. Finally, uh, they revolt in 66. After a whole series of cruel Roman governors, Pontius Pilate, the person portrayed as this person who doesn't want to execute Jesus, who is of mixed minds, who I think White says she had a dream, who says, uh, don't have anything to do with this righteous man, and so on and so forth. He was removed from Palestine as the most brutal governor who did not, who did not uh, squabble to shed blood at the slightest provocation. And we know that from two different historians, Philo of Alexandria and Josephus, and, a, and there's a third one. In fact, Philo has a mission to guess where they actually removed Pontius Pilate because he was so atrocious and so brutal, which is something for the Romans. Uh, in any case, other governors came, and you can read that, uh, Josephus is no, uh, you know, even though he's trying to curry favor with the Romans, he's pretty straightforward about that. He, he, he says the governor just whipped up this, tried to whip the people into uprising. And then Nero put the last governors in, and Nero had a real thing for some reason. He wanted to be a god, and he was living on that and so on. So uh, things got really bad under his, under his reign. And the governors were worse and worse and worse, and finally the people were driven to revolt in 66. But I want to tell you, the first thing they did was kill all the high priests who they saw as collaborators, and burn the debt records, and then burn all the Herodian palaces. So I have to tell you that the picture of the Jews in the New Testament, as represented by the class you're seeing, is totally inaccurate. Because the fact of the matter is, the Jews hated that class as much or more than anyone else. And the moment they got a chance to overturn it, they, they went and did so. And this was a popular uprising that swept across the whole country. The high priests were put in power uh, by the Roman Herodian governors. So I don't want to get into who's responsible for what or whether what occurred. But the point is that the Jews hated all these people as much or more than anyone else. And uh, this is not the way things are portrayed. These are portrayed as legitimate representatives as, uh, of the uh, Jewish people. And that, for a start, is just absolutely wrong. You know, it's just wrong. Her Herod is presented as a Jewish king. That's absolutely wrong. He killed all the Jewish kings. Anyway, be that as it may, the Jews lost this war. And they lost the next one, too. And they were, you know, considered really troublesome by that point by the Romans. And at that point, they were basically 
expelled from what we call Palestine now. And the Romans renamed this province Palestina, which is where I began. And the Jews were seen from that moment as having surrendered to the Roman Empire, in, per in, in particular as having surrendered to Caesar, which is why those Judaic capital coins are so important. So, the next 1600 years of European history has to do with the fact that the Jews are looked upon as the serfs of the successors to Caesar, insofar as all these kings in the West in Europe, Charlemagne and all the others, saw themselves as the second Holy Roman Empire and so on and so forth, as successor to the Roman em emperors and so on, they saw the Jews as having surrendered to them as well. And there were certain restrictions put upon the Jews that we'll cover next time in the Christian period when the Christians basically took over the Roman Empire after Constantine in the uh, 300. Uh, restrictions having to do with not being able to own land, not being able to serve in the army, uh, not being, um, as uh, being basically, as I said, serfs of the crown, so the money they made had to, could be taxed directly to the, to the royal authorities so that the Jews could be used as a kind of sop or sponge to soak up money from the people so that the aristocratic classes could, in fact, benefit from this kind of uh, situation and wouldn't be blamed. So uh, the Jews were not allowed to participate in the trade guilds. They were not allowed to be artisans. And uh, so they were forced more and more into these reprobate uh, trades. And what we'll get is, in, in Eastern Europe, basically, they were rag pickers, which is why so many Jews ended up in the tailoring business. When the Jews came to America, they were all sort of, you know, uh, traveling salesmen, rag picker sort of people, who then ended up owning, uh, you know, covered wagons with goods, dry goods and uh, uh, tailoring activities. So ultimately then they started their covered wagons and became department stores. So then it became Macy's, Bloomingdale's, uh, <laughs> Goldwater's, uh, you name it. Every big city in America has a Jewish department store sitting in the middle of it. I forget what the one is in Columbus, Ohio. I used to know the name of it. But uh, everyone in Goldwater is a convert from Judaism. He's in Arizona. And uh, over and over and over and over and over again, that's <laughs> the weird thing. And then, of course, finally, Levy's trousers out of the time of the gold rush in San Francisco because they were in dry goods. Uh, that was the only profession that had been open to them. And so they made the trousers for the guys who were, uh, who were um, uh, digging the gold. And now, I guess, three quarters of you are wearing Levi's trousers. Anyway, we'll stop there. Pick up there next time. You start reading um, Mendelssohn. He's going to try to get the Jews on the right track again in the 1700s. But uh, we'll pick up a little bit for that, and I'll, uh, we'll deal with the book situation next time. Okay? Hopefully, I didn't keep you too long. I'll turn this thing off. Wait, 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 wait. Let me get this thing off if I can. <laughs>